there is growing organisation of a far right um, political agenda that uses what you might term equalities issues as its gateway drug to power. Uh, and women's bodies and women's rights have been at the forefront of that. We are sleepwalking into having those debates here in England or not even recognising the role that the UK could play in partnership with our colleagues in Europe in standing up for progressive values because we think it's on the extremes, it's on the fringes. It's in the heart of the UK Parliament already. Stella, hello. Hello. How are you? Uh, <laughs> Watery eyed. <laughs> Aren't we all? <laughs> because it is not the spring we were promised. No. But that's that that's, is the next uh, piece of legislation. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I think it was uh, Matt Letitia yesterday who said that it was a uh, the government who calculated making it hot during lockdown and cold when it's not. Well, <laughs> you know, I mean there's there's gotta be some power somewhere. Yeah. Hasn't there? He's thinking um, big here. Yeah. And he's not watched too much Netflix at all. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's start with the bill. So what are you proposing? What is it that you want? So there's a group of us who want to learn from countries around the world where abortion has been decriminalised. I don't think a lot of women in England and Wales realise they don't actually have a legal right to an abortion. And abortion is still illegal in this country. It's just that we have legislation that exempts them from prosecution if they follow certain rules, which includes seeing two doctors and basically having to explain why they want an abortion because otherwise it would men make them go mad. Um, and you might say, well, OK, that's a philosophical thing to, to deal with, but actually it has real world consequences of people's access to abortion, because if you have to get several appointments, that can cause delays. Um, I think abortion is a healthcare, not criminal matter, in which case it needs an underpinning, which is about healthcare and proper regulation, which is about accessing it in a way that is good for your health. And one of the things that we think would improve access is to decriminalise abortion up to the existing time limit of 24 weeks so that you can make it easier to access an abortion earlier on in a process. And also, frankly, to not have to explain yourself because it's your choice. It's not a matter of public discussion. And if we decriminalise it, then it becomes about abortion being able to, accessible to women when they would like to within that 24 time week. Well, so t talk to me about this 24 weeks, because yeah. I think this is the bit that I've, I've personally been actually quite confused about. So are you saying you want to decriminalise it up to term or up until 24 weeks? No. And the amendment that we have put forward uh, keeps the integrity of the 24 week limit. What it does say is post then, and we recognise there are instances in which this happens, and there currently are in the, in the current in situation. So in the current situation, there's a medical reason. And actually, you really want to protect those because those tend to be the abortions that are the most heartbreaking of all uh, when you've got, say, a fatal fetal abnormality, a, ch a baby that will not live if it's born. I don't think the state should be making any woman carry to term a baby they know is going to die. Um, what we said is that we would, like a lot of other countries, have the, the retain the, the legislation that we've got, but you have the director of public prosecutions who would decide whether or not there was any public interest at all in pursuing either a woman or uh, a medic who assisted her within good faith post those 24-week limits. So it's decriminalisation up to 24 weeks, and it is then basically taking... Only in the very extreme circumstances would you want to have any kind of uh, involvement of the DPP and really saying this is a healthcare matter. Because what we're seeing right now, and the case for decriminalisation is overwhelming, is there's been a real uptick of investigations and prosecutions of women. Um, so 15-year-old girls who've had a stillbirth or didn't even realise that they were pregnant, ending up with a police officer rather than a counsellor standing at their hospital bed... The challenge is to get this right, to recognise where decriminalisation would help improve access to the services, where it would recognise a woman's right to be able to have an abortion um, and to do so in a way that also protects the 24 week limit and protects that people feel um, that there could be instances in which it would be right for the DPP to be involved. But that's an incredibly high bar. I mean, there's very few other areas of law where we would have that bar and it would bring us into line with a lot of other jurisdictions that have decriminalised abortion and said, well, we think it should only be available up to 24 weeks, uh, except in exceptional medical circumstances, and we would retain that. But um, we would also recognise that having a criminal foundation on something that is healthcare is out of date in the 21st century. So with this explanation, I think this, this sort of... <laughs> this is very confusing. No, I, I recognise because I've, this I've has already been... had a number of um, people, you know, Isabel Oakeshott and Neil O'Brien saying that somehow we're talking about abortion at birth. Nobody is talking about abortion at birth. And frankly, it doesn't help anybody to have that kind of inflammatory language. 
It's also why the most critical part of the amendment that we are proposing is to learn from Northern Ireland. So in Northern Ireland, abortion is actually legal, mm. unlike the rest of the United Kingdom, and it is decriminalised there. Um, but crucially in Northern Ireland, the Secretary of State has a direct responsibility to ensure that women can access a safe and legal abortion under those regulations, so under the time limits that exist. What that means in practice is it means that the Secretary of State has had to do battle with all those people in Northern Ireland who do not agree with abortion at all and who sought to use their position, whether in the civil service, in the NHS, in the police or in any public service, to try and thwart access. Because remember, up until a couple of years ago, there was no access to abortion in Northern Ireland. And there still isn't in a lot of areas as well. But it's, it's changing because the Secretary of State has had to battle these mm. people. We should be really alarmed in this country. The anti-choice movement has been fundraising. It's got millions of pounds. It's much more organised. It's very active in our NHS. It's active in our civil service. It's active in Parliament. Um, what this amendment also does is it brings in what I would call the Northern Ireland lock. So it designates somebody in government whose job it is to ensure that women can access that legal right that Parliament says that they should have if it passes this amendment. And we believe that's really critical because, as we saw with buffer zones, so Parliament voted for buffer zones around abortion clinics in England and Wales two years ago. We still don't have them. And indeed, the government is currently running a consultation to overturn that by the back door. That is a consultation that has been written, signed off by not just one Home Secretary, but countless officials. There are people who would seek to thwart access to abortion, who would use the opportunity of abortion law reform to argue for guidelines, regulations, um, secondary legislation, which is what we've seen with buffer zones. Having that lock from Northern Ireland would mean they couldn't do anything that was punitive, that would prevent access to abortion. And that's why Northern Ireland, they have buffer zones already, because it is part of the human rights framework. So, so you would still be allowed to stand outside and silently pray? Under the government's plans, that's not explicitly what Parliament voted against. Right. But you see, this is the challenge, is the anti-choice movement is licking their lips at the idea that they can use the positions that they have to be able to undermine access. And we've seen it before. We saw it before on the myth that somehow there was sex selection taking place and the arguments they put forward there. Already we've seen attacks on the term limit. And as I say, often those abortions happening at the latest period are the most tragic and the ones we need to protect the most because they're for people's medical needs. Um, what we see with this amendment is three things. We see decriminalisation, improving early access to abortion, because you want women who choose to have an abortion to have it as early as possible because it's the least invasive. They can take pills rather than having to have a medical procedure. Um, it well, also, if you're on the argument of pro-life, that is the time that you, you would be pushing for those earlier abortions because that is well, but when you, see, you get into a the lot of these term. people are arguing against what we call telemedicine, against trusting women to make those decisions, because actually what they don't want is women to have access to abortion at all. Um, the second thing, as I say, it does is to tackle that 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 challenge post twenty four weeks and give a defence to medics. It gives a defence to women. It sets an incredibly high bar about when you would ever want any. Um, involvement of prosecutors. And the third thing it does is bring in this Northern Ireland lock to protect us against any future leg leg legislation or regulation that would undermine access. So it's trying to recognise that the case for decriminalisation is overwhelming, but how you do it is probably more complicated than any of us would want to be operating in an environment where, frankly, women's bodies are the battlefield of the culture wars. So just to get one thing really clear, because I think this is something that's been perhaps confused mm -hmm. when, in the write-ups or the discussion of this. So after 24 weeks, would you want women to be able to go to their doctor and have the ability to access... Um, access an abortion out of choice and not talking about a medical circumstance well, no that's not that's currently what not the situation so the situation at the moment is that you can access an abortion at a later stage if there is a medical case for mm -hmm. it and we trust doctors to be involved in it. that wouldn't change that is the settled will that there will be circumstances as a fatal fetal abnormality is a, is a classic example of this where to ask a woman to carry a baby to term because that fatal treatment has only been identified post 24 weeks is seen as a hugely damaging thing to do.
Uh, and I trust doctors and women in that circumstance, as we do under the existing law. So we're not talking about tampering with any of the time limits. What we're talking about is improving access at an early stage, recognising that even post-24 weeks, really, this is still a healthcare matter, but you retain um, some of the, the criminal legislation to provide a, a background to that 24 weeks. I mean, that's where the, the law is settled in, the, in England and Wales. And then crucially, bringing in this Northern Ireland lock to make sure that no reform of abortion is used to roll back access. So, for example, to try and tamper with people's access to telemedicine or to not have buffer zones so that you make it impossible for women to physically visit yeah. an abortion. The clinic. telemedicine is quite a big debate mm. in this country, isn't it? Because yeah. that was something that was available during the pandemic. Yeah. Um, and whenever we talk about now, like, you know, should women be able to have at home abortions? I think it sounds sort of like it's some kind of medieval um, procedure. Mm. But instead, what happens is that you go to a clinic and you take the pills there. You would like it to be available at home. Well, so actually, it currently is. We currently have telemedicine, and now the vast majority. Of, I thought it had been taken away. No, after no, no. COVID. They tried to take it away uh, post pandemic. Right. We voted to continue to have it because it is about making it easier for women to access an abortion earlier on in their pregnancy. Right. Um, once you get past 10, 11 weeks, then it does become a medical procedure. That is incredibly invasive compared to being able to take pills. And I think, as I say, all of us want to see women who choose to have an abortion do so as early and efficiently as possible, frankly, mm -hmm. so that it is not as invasive for them as it would be at a later date. Just one little point of clarity before mm -hmm. I ask you the next question. So if a woman after 24 weeks had done something silly to themselves at home you would want them you would want that to be decriminalized we're not no we're not talking about but what we're talking about is saying that there would only be very exceptional circumstances in would which that, that be would one be of seen those? Uh, i'm not going to prejudge those circumstances i think this is primarily a healthcare matter but we are retaining and i want to be really clear because there will be people online who will try to argue otherwise mm. and there are other amendments that don't. So this is, I can only talk particularly about the amendment that we've put forward. Um, we're retaining the idea that the Director of Public Prosecutions would, would look at whether or not it was required to use that legislation. We should be clear that even if you take away all this legislation, there are other criminal offences that would remain. Um, so... Um, one of the things that's really troubling, for example, is we've seen a lot of crisis pregnancies being investigated and prosecuted under the 1800s piece of legislation um, because prosecutors felt they couldn't prove other offences. But there are other all, all sorts of other offences about um, uh, the well, I mean, there's murder. If you really think that is what has happened, we're talking primarily but about see, the legislation is, that sits underneath abortion itself. But I think this is really important, mm. and I understand that you're reticent to answer this question, probably in the way that you would like to, because of the online furor. But I think I think it's really integral to the point. So if you're going to decriminalise abortion in, mm -hmm. with women, and you know someone has done something stupid to themselves at 30 weeks, well, you know after 24 weeks, then that would. You, 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 they would not go to prison for that. I no, think that's what this no. legislation is saying. We're being very saying. clear that there shouldn't be any prison or incarceration. I don't think right. people felt that Carla Foster, who was the case people know, and in fact the, the public overwhelmingly said, look, she shouldn't go to prison. She had three other children. Yeah. Um, it didn't mean that there wasn't something there that needed to be investigated or, or that there wasn't a safeguarding issue. Those safeguarding regulations would retain, in any case, they already exist. What we're saying is the threshold, the reason why we're concerned is because there's been this massive uptake of 40 investigations in the last year alone of women for having an abortion in of itself. Mm. So not post the current regulation, but having an abortion because that's the way the law is written. And that influences both how services are right. provided. It means that there is a fear, um, and, and particularly talking to um, gynecologists who deal with still, stillbirths, that they're really concerned to see police turning up at the do uh, at the bed of someone who's had a stillbirth, which is when somebody really needs a counsellor and they need support. What we're saying is that the evidentiary test of any form of police involvement must be much higher and it must be at the level of the DPP. It always feels like when we have a discussion around abortion, I think that the two extremes sort of take totally. over the, the, the grey area, the sensible grey area that is in the middle, because what you're saying is entirely rational, but it has the ability to be misconstrued or misinterpreted. And one person who did that, you mentioned earlier, was uh, Conservative MP Neil O'Brien, yes. um, who's a senior, um, senior MP. 
Um, and and he said that Stella is arguing for people to be able to kill a baby the day before it's due to be born and face no consequences. This is an incredibly extreme and bad proposal. Is that what you're advocating for? No, absolutely not. And Neil hasn't seen the words of the amendment that we as a group, and it's a cross-party group, so this is not a party political issue, um, have tabled because it's a quirk that right now Parliament isn't sitting, so the amendment doesn't appear on the order paper for him to even have seen for him to say such things. But what his words do speak to is a ratcheting up of the debate and discussion around abortion in this country in the way that we have seen in America. And I would appeal and urge anybody who considers themselves to be pro-choice not to be complacent that what has happened in America with the attacks on a woman's right to choose would never happen here in England and Wales because they do not realise how access to abortion is under a sustained and persistent attack. That is one of the reasons why we want to bring in this Northern Ireland lock as well, to prevent those attacks from happening behind closed doors. Because what is driving this increase in prosecution of women for having an abortion in of itself isn't entirely clear. It hasn't come from anything democratic or anything through Parliament. It's come from possibly the NHS or people within the police who don't uh, support a woman's right to choose. I would appeal to Neil to perhaps look at the words before he speaks and understand actually what this amendment will do and how it retains the integrity of the 24-week limit. And that would guide what services were provided, I say, with the caveat that where there were cases post-24 weeks, that would be covered by the current medical exemptions that we already have. Um, And also to recognise that if you consider yourself to be um, pro-life, you know, restricting access to abortion, using this kind of inflammatory language doesn't stop abortions. It just stops safe abortions. Mm -hmm. And what we've seen time and time again, and we're now seeing in America, is the consequences of when you restrict access to a safe uh, and legal service. And the consequences are that women die. And the same thing with Hungary. But um, there are actually quite a few pro-life conservative MPs. I think What's interesting is when when the topic comes up in Parliament, the number of MPs that are willing to stand up and say that they don't agree with abortion. So you're right to say that it is, we are sort of teetering on the edge of it not being taken away. But there is a danger there that we could, we, we could well, I won't be hyperbolic, but... <laughs> Well, let me then, as somebody who has lived this debate for several years and been subjected to campaigning and targeted attacks by some of these people, and I say that as somebody who has also sat down with people who are passionately against abortion, whether in my own community or nationally, and had perfectly decent and reasonable debates. But the uh, inflammatory language and the insensitivity, I've had these people in my community telling people that I want to kill babies and put them in bins, um, harassing my local community, putting leaflets through everybody's doors um, with graphic imagery on in my local area. Um, This is an American style tactic that we have had imported into the into this country that we didn't have when we last did work on abortion reform. Um, And we've seen it in the NHS. We've seen a growing level of anti-choice activism. And it is anti-choice. It's not pro-life because, as I say, you put women's lives at risk when you restrict access to abortion. Um, That is not to say that these people should guide what we do in terms of service provision and that we shouldn't try to make progress and learn from other countries that have decriminalised abortion and what that's done to women's health there. But it is to recognise that there will be a backlash. So you need to get ahead of that backlash if you actually want to achieve the goal that we want, which is to have a safe and legal and hopefully local service for women, that if they make that choice, they are able to make it in dignity and in privacy. Do you think the Conservative Party has become more evangelical since Rishi Sunak took over? I think there has definitely been organisation um, on a practical level. We've seen organisations like Right to Life recruiting lots and lots of staff. That requires a lot of money. Uh, we see much more activism within Parliament from the um, anti-choice movement. It cuts across Parliament. I want to be very open and honest. This is not a party political issue. I know there are people on my own side who disagree on a woman's right to choose. I think the point I'm making is that it has become a much more contested issue than perhaps those who consider themselves pro-choice would recognise. And I would be extremely wary of not being able to overcome that because at the end of the day, what we all want to do is make sure that women can access a a safe service. When you know that, I mean, next year, we're going to have the National Conservative, actually it might be later this year, National Conservative Conference and, you know, Suella Ravan is going to be speaking on the same stage as Victor Orban. 
when you hear things like that, you know, serving conservative MPs standing alongside extremely, uh, well, conservative in the actual, you know, in the, the sense of the word figures, does that worry you about, you know, where women's rights could go in the UK? Well, we've seen that women's rights and women's bodies are the battlefield of the far right culture wars. We've seen it not just in America, but in Europe. I sit here, I'm the chair of the Labour movement for Europe, and I'm also talking to my colleagues in different countries around Europe. You know, people might be worried that Trump might win the American presidency, but they're not looking at Orban, they're not looking at Georgia Maloney, they're not looking at Gert Wilders, um, the rise of the AFD, uh, Marine Le Pen in France. There is growing organisation of a far right um, political agenda that uses what you might term equalities issues as its gateway drug to power. Uh, and women's bodies and women's rights have been at the forefront of that. The powerful story is Poland, where Poland, where it was women who organised and resisted, and they did so on the basis of pr defending their rights to choose what happens to their own bodies. And that's what led to the success of Donald Tusk. And I think there's a real concern for many of us that we are sleepwalking into having those debates here in England or not even recognising the role that the UK could play in partnership with our colleagues in Europe in standing up for progressive values because we think it's on the extremes, it's on the fringes. It's in the heart of the UK Parliament already. Um, it's very much in the debates that are happening at a grassroots level. Um, this is a good example of where as you saw in that tweet, the extremes are starting out with the conversation. The reality is a much more thoughtful, measured proposal that is seeking to balance people's concerns about time limits, concerns about regulation and concerns about a woman's dignity and, and, and equality. I hope that's the debate we can have in Parliament. I fear in the coming days as we get to this, it'll be the heat, not the light that people will see coming forward. I just urge people not to be um, complacent that somehow people aren't responding to that or reacting to that because actually whether it is on women's rights whether it is on how we treat trans people whether it is on how we uh, respond even to refugees these battles are being organized and fed by that international rhetoric but they are very much having a consequence in our homes and final word read the amendment <laughs> it's an old-fashioned <laughs> uh, you know obviously that's what makes me uh you know fit all the kind of bugbears as somebody who campaigns to work with our European partners who supports women's rights old-fashioned idea maybe read what's on the paper first before deciding you don't like it mm.